Hey everybody, Ted Forbes here from The Art of Photography. On the show today, we're gonna to do something a little bit different than we've been doing in the last couple months. And I wanna talk about a camera that's just come out. And uh, this is a new Nikon camera. This is the D7100. And there's a number of reasons why I wanna share this with you today. Um, but just to give you a little background, this is the top of the line of the APC sized sensor cameras. So it's not a full frame. Um, personally, I've never been a huge fan. It's not my first choice to go with APC sensors for a number of reasons, mainly because I think I come from 35 millimeter school shooting and I want focal lengths to behave a certain way and have a certain kind of distortion to them which you have to make sacrifices for when you have a smaller sensor. Um, however, I think Nikon have done something with this camera, uh, done a couple things that changed that quite a bit for everybody and I'm going to share that with you today. But just to give you a little background, the D7100 uh, is the successor to the D7000, which, you know, the numbering system that the uh, the camera companies do is very confusing, but uh, this is the, I guess, successor or replacement for the D7000 that you can still get. For the most part, most of the features have been carried over from the D7000. Uh, the layout's the same, the camera looks the same, it's a little bit lighter, but uh, there's not a whole lot of difference there. However, one thing I think is important to mention is that I believe Nikon were getting their sensors from Sony before, and this is a brand new sensor that Toshiba makes that they're using in this camera. It's a 24 megapixel sensor, and it performs extremely well in low light. And the other interesting thing about this too is typically digital cameras over the sensor have a low pass filter um, that basically helps, um, decreases distortions caused by moiré or uh, aliasing problems, things like that. Um, that filter has been removed in this camera, um, and for what I've been able to read, engineers are basically saying the sensor doesn't need it now. And after shooting with it, it's very sharp. It's a lot sharper than the D7000 was, and it performs a little bit better in really low light, which is very cool too. Of course, most modern digital cameras do that very well these days. Uh, but there's a couple other cool features that have been added on here. The bracketing function is amazing. Um, the fact that uh, the lens compatibility on this is awesome. Um, it has an internal autofocus motor, so you can actually use any autofocus lens ever made by Nikon. And you can also mount any AI or AIS variation, um, pretty much any lens that goes back to 1970-something, all the manual focus lenses. Um, another thing that's really cool about when you are using manual focus is, you know, typically smaller sensors um, yield cameras that don't have very big viewfinders, so it's really hard to actually focus a manual focus lens on here. Uh, they have added a digital range finder in here, which I find amazing to use. It works a lot like the Nikon F4, if you remember that camera back in the old days did. And basically on here, you select your auto sensor point and you turn the lens and it gives you two little arrows on the bottom left of the screen and it lets you know if that point is in focus or not. So it does have focus assists on it, which opens up an enormous amount of possibilities um, for using this camera for both still and video purposes. And we're going to sit down and take a look and really get into this and talk about some of the reasons why I think this is an unbelievable camera. And I think it really is a game changer uh, for photography in general. So come on over, let's have a look. Okay, so the D7100, uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at the camera. It looks a lot like the D7000, if you were familiar with that. Um, I bought mine from B&H, and I actually bought mine with the kit lens that comes with this, which is a, uh, is a Nikkor 18-105 uh, to 105 millimeter, and it does have a vibration reduction. It's a VR lens. I will say this. The kit lens, if you don't have a lens and you're interested in buying this camera, it's, it's a decent lens. Uh, you won't be sorry you bought it. However, I think if you already own some lenses, particularly if you already have a zoom lens, this probably isn't one of the finer Nikkor lenses, uh, but it certainly, for starting out, uh, does the trick just fine. It's very sharp. Um, you know, I just think there's other things that, that work just as well, if not better. Um, so anyway, um, as far as the camera goes, um, you know, a couple options you have. On the top, basically you have your hot shoot, brand new in here is they've added a stereo microphone on for video. I'm not a big fan of built-in camera microphones, however, this one does perform very well. Um, what's also interesting, we'll talk about video in a second, but handheld, um, it doesn't have a lot of the jello effect that goes on with, um, you know, something like the 5D Mark II. They've made some improvements there. Um, it's a very nice camera. You can actually shoot handheld without too much shake with it, and the video is beautiful. Um, there are some caveats with video, and I'll talk about those when we get to it, but anyway, that is one of the things that is new. Um, you have your, your, um, your exposure um, mode switch here, so if you want to be able to whip into manual mode, um, auto, there's a lock on there, which is kind of strange because I don't really hit that by accident. There are two custom user modes on here too, which is, which is very cool. Below you have your drive speed, so if you want single shot, if you want continuous, low speed, high speed, etc. And there is a funky little lock on there too as well, but uh, not sure what's up with that, but hey, not a big deal. Um, over on the right-hand side, you've got your power switch, your on and off. You have the metering selection mode. You have your record switch for video, and then you also have your exposure um, compensation. So if you want to under or overexpose, we'll come back to that in a minute because there's a new bracketing feature that's really cool in this camera as well. 
On the back of the camera, the layout's still very standard. You have your, your selector switch. You have an autofocus lock. Um, one thing I should mention about this over the D7000 is now that you have 51 AF points, which is quite a bit. Uh, again, for a camera at this price point, that's pretty amazing. So if you rely a lot on autofocus, I don't particularly myself, but if you shoot a lot of wildlife, less sports, stuff like that, it's got a very well done advanced autofocus system in here. Um, you have your AEL lock and autofocus lock button on the back. You have your preview trash button. Um, and then you have your menu selector, all the standard layout. They have changed a little bit too. Now for the live view, you've got two modes. You've got a still mode and a video mode, which we'll look at in a second, and your info button at the bottom little speaker there. Uh, moving around at the front of the camera, and here's some of the stuff that's new that's actually really cool. On the bottom you've got your um, autofocus uh, on-off switch, and then the button actually allows you to toggle the autofocus mode that you're in. But what's really cool is there's a bracketing button on here right now, and I'll show you what that does. I like to bracket shots a lot, even with an advanced metering system that you know Nikon does have with the 3D matrix stuff. Basically, if I push that button, you're going to see on the screen this changes, and this allows me to turn bracketing on, uh, but with the lower switch here. So if I want um, three full stops or if I want five, um, you can actually go down and you can say just give me plus two, minus three, plus three, etc. Go ahead and turn that back. Um, and then the, also in the uh, front selector switch here, you can change uh, how wide a bracket you want to do. So bracketing basically, if you don't know, it's, you're going to take a picture and then it's going, if you have it select, select if, well, let's say you have it set to bracket three exposures. The first one will be what the cameras determine the exposure is. The second and the third will either be a stop under or a stop over, or you can program this any number of ways. So if you want two stops over, so if you want to overexpose or underexpose, you can do that. Um, it also tells you how by what stop. So this is one stop, or I can say, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, etc. So if I put it at 0.3, it's going to bracket. If I say, give me you know, a, a standard bracket, which is the regular shot, then one under, and then one overexposed, it's going to do it with a third of a stop in this case, or I can set that to a stop. So you can really get fine-tuned with this, and uh, you can do two stops, three stops, etc. So if you like to shoot a lot of HDR, this is a pretty amazing camera um, for that. Uh, it, it, it really makes a lot of sense and, and does very well. Um, the autofocus um, is very good on here. Like I said, I don't really rely on it too much, but I will typically throw it into a mode where I can use the selector switch, and I actually like to be able to move this around and pick my autofocus point. This camera handles that very, very well. Well, which I really like. Um, and it seems that the autofocus points really cover almost the majority of the screen, which is a little bit of improvement from, from the last um, camera as well. Okay, and I also talked about the ability to use um, older manual focus lenses on here. And this is what's really cool about that. If you use any autofocus lens, it will work with this camera because there's an internal motor, so some of the older ones will still work just fine. Um, I have a lot of old manual Nikon lenses, manual focus lenses, that I have used on my Canon, actually, for video in the past. And I am very excited about being able to use them not only for video, but also for stills. One of the things that's really cool on here is it does support full-on uh, matrix metering uh, for all manual focus lenses that are AI, AIS variety, so anything but the non-AI. Okay, and I also have this set up. There's a custom function switch down here at the bottom, so when I set that and I have a manual focus lens mounted, you do need to tell it what lens you are using so it knows what the maximum aperture is supposed to be and what the focal length is. So if I hold down the function button, you're going to be able to see the screen here. I'm on the N2 setting. There's up to nine storage settings here. See, these aren't stored, nine, th three, four, etc. But I have set two of them up. One for my 105 2.5, which I set up here. You'll do this in the settings. And then I also have a second one for my 24 millimeter 2.8. They work very well. Um, basically, what you're doing here is you're telling the camera what the focal length of the lens is and what the maximum aperture is. And that basically allows the camera to do full 3D matrix metering with. So that is very cool. And if you like the Nikon metering, which is one of the best, you know, it, it works with all your old manual focus lenses. The the other thing that really helps too is typically the viewfinder on here, which is okay. It's a little dim for my taste, but it's decent. But I still have, because of the size of these cameras, I have a hard time getting into focus just simply because my eyes can't see detail that small or that, and I wear eyeglasses too. So that does create some problems for me. One thing that's nice in here is they have added a digital rangefinder in here, and it's a lot like if you ever saw the Nikon F4 back in the old days, it did the same thing. And basically what you do is you'll, you'll use the, the selection wheel here to select where you want your autofocus point to be. Now, you're not going to be able to autofocus. It's a manual focus lens. But you select the point, 
And what you're going to do is then turn the lens collar to focus, and it's going to tell you whether you're under, over, or it, the circle in the middle lights up when you're in focus for that autofocus point. So in this case, now a manual focus point. But anyway, it works like a, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. And I love the fact I can use my old lenses now on here, and I really don't have to see that well through them, and they will still work. I can get things in focus, which has been a problem for me in the past. All right, so let's talk about video for a second using the D7100. Um, the video on here, I'm going to roll some B-roll over the top of some things I shot. I've had this camera about a week, and I've been pretty amazed with it. Um, as far as the video goes, the picture is amazing. It's smooth, much like the stills. The noise resolution on here does not really kick in until you get to... It becomes noticeable at 6400, but still usable, depending on what it is you're shooting. Anything higher, and you're going to start seeing a lot of grain involved. But the video is really nice. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, the low pass filter has been left off of this camera, so there's no physical filter in front of the sensor, and uh, it's designed that it doesn't need it. And I really have not noticed any aliasing or moiré patterns going on, which is really nice. Um, it's a wonderful camera to shoot video with. The stereo microphone for an internal mic on a camera is probably the best I've ever used. That still doesn't mean I would use it exclusively if I were actually shooting an interview or something like this. I would still use an external mic, but you know, it's a small caveat and not a big deal because I really don't expect um, the audio to be wonderful out of camera so it's a nice surprise that it is still very usable. Um, I can shoot handheld with this camera which is really nice and you don't get a whole lot of shake or a whole lot of the jello effect that you see on you know a lot of the DSLR video cameras up to this point. One thing that I'm going to point out on here, and if you are buying this camera and you want to do a lot of video or a lot with the live view on it, um, a couple complaints that I have on this, and these are all fixable with a firmware update, I'm pretty sure, and so we'll probably see that from Nikon pretty soon. But basically to go into live view, what we're going to do is you go ahead and you have to select between still and video mode and this gets the crop going because the crop is different between the two. So if I go up to still mode and I select live view, you're going to get the, well it's just shooting the desk, but you're going to get the full screen for the, for the still photo and you can shoot your stills in live view. Uh, let's turn that off and let's go over to the video mode and you're going to get the 16 by 9 crop and it's blown out for because I'm overexposed. Um, Essentially, in live view, you should be able to control all your aperture, shutter speed, etc. And I can. I can go in here and select the ISO, and we can turn that down to something more usable. So let's put down 200, and I can change my shutter speed as well. But what's interesting is I cannot change the aperture. Aperture has changed with the front dial here. And if you'll see here, I'm turning it, and it's not doing anything. This is a pain when you're framing up video. What I have to actually do is turn this off, change the aperture, and then turn it back on and then it starts changing and this is a little bit of a pain in the rear end um, it does not like to behave like you want it to behave so anyway that is uh, slight frustration number one so we don't have four now um, the other frustration which is very similar is in live view for stills if I change the aperture you can watch the f-stop here it does change but you'll see that the exposure is not changing at all um, now this is compensating for it but that is another bug here that's not working and like I said I'm sure Nikon can probably fix that in a firmware update it does not keep you from shooting video and if you're using old manual lenses you have an aperture collar anyway so it you won't have that problem like I said, not a deal breaker. Just know that it's a slight frustration you're going to have to deal with, um, you know, as you're checking this camera out. The last thing I want to talk about on here, and I think this is really important too, is the performance in low light. And I'll show some images over the top here too. The performance is extremely good. Um, it does still not, I mean, if you're going for extreme detail with low noise, you still want to use a tripod and you still want to use, um, you know, whatever the lowest ISO you can get away with is. However, um, a deal breaker for me, and this is just goes back to the 35 millimeter days is that I want to be able to get usable shots in low light without having to use a flash and this camera will allow you to do that um, the ISO performance is very good um, at the higher ISOs you can really get up to about 2500 before you start seeing any noise at all 3200 is fine there's a little bit of noise in shadow areas but it's not awful um, at 6400 you do start to see some some um, uh, the, the image starts to degrade a little bit um, mainly when you're really blowing up looking in you're catching details um, you're gonna start to see them start going away and still usable at 6400 but and it's the best ISO performance of any DSLR I've personally used um, so <laughs> do not think I'm complaining uh, if you push the camera which there are ways you can do it past 64 um, you're not going to um, uh, be very happy with the results it does get very grainy but the low-light performance is exceptional 
Okay, another thing I want to show you on here that I think is really cool as far as lenses go is the D7100 actually has built-in lens distortion correction. So, you know, if you're used to using, uh, in particular, you're going to see this a lot on um, smaller sensor size cameras, but wide angles typically start to hover into fisheye territory, so they're hard to build for smaller lenses to, to stay really wide. And a lot of times, even though it's not a fisheye, you still get an enormous amount of barrel distortion in there, which um, just does not look really good. But one thing you can do, which is really nice, now if you're using Photoshop, something like that, you can add correction for this. Um, but what's really cool in here is you can do it in camera. If I go to the menu, and I'm going to go into my shooting menu actually, and you can scroll down, and it's under, let's see, active delighting here. There is, yeah, we have HDR controls. We also have auto distortion control, and I could leave that on. I've tested it. Sometimes it doesn't give you exactly 100% crop, but neither will fixing it in Photoshop. It'll actually distort it a little bit and bring it in, but it fixes those, those blemishes with particularly wider angle lenses. This is really, really cool, and it makes this more usable for me because if I want, in this case, I've got a, uh, a 50 millimeter lens on here, but because of the crop factor, this ends up acting more like a 75, 85 millimeter lens. Um, I want this to have a portrait lens effect and really look beautiful, enhance the subject's face, and it will do that subtle shift for you. So that was one thing that's really cool. Another thing that's really cool here too, and we're still in the shooting menu, I'm going to go down and I'm going to show, whoops, I'll scroll down, and you also have a way to do multiple exposures in here, sorry, shooting menu. And here it is, multi-exposure. If I go into this, I can turn it off and I can say number of shots and I can say auto gain, etc. This is really cool. It's a little bit gimmicky, I thought at first, but back in the old 35 millimeter days, there used to be a way to flip a switch to keep the film from advancing. So you could do double exposures. Again, you can create these in Photoshop, but it's kind of fun to play with these in camera and let let the camera do it on the fly. Um, if I turn this on and I have the number of shots to two, it allows me to take two shots and we'll blend them together much like a multiple exposure. Um, it's really pretty cool. It's a lot of fun to play with. Like I said, it's it's a little gimmicky, so it's not something you're going to use all the time, but it's still um, you know a big plus for this camera, I think, to have that on there. Okay, so that's my two cents and review of the new Nikon D7100. Check it out. Um, I really think that for the price point and the money on this, you're not going to find much better camera with more features packed into it. It's a very versatile camera. For me, the biggest selling points on here, um, believe it or not, I think the quality of the video is amazing. And even though there's some hassles with the live view right now, I bet you Nikon fixes that in a firmware update, and I don't think it's a deal breaker for me. The video is amazing. Low light performance. Um, it, it, there's so much versatility that's packed into here, I think, for this price point that you're not going to do much better. Oh, and manual focus lenses, just because I have a lot of them and I like to use them. Um, it's amazing. So anyway, check it out. Um, if you want to read the full review on this, we have the full review on our website, which is theartofphotography.tv. So you can check it out there. I go into a little bit more detail on a couple things on there too. So anyway, and if you want to get yours, um, I have some links on there that'll save you some money, hopefully too. So check it out. And once again, everybody, this has been The Art of Photography, and I will see you guys next time. Thanks.